Letter from Birmingham City Jail. Martin Luther King Jr., April 16, 1963. Editor's Note. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was arrested on April 12, 1963 in Birmingham, Alabama by Bull Connor, the Public Safety Commissioner, for parading without a permit and for defying a state order banning demonstrations. The same day that King was arrested, a letter signed by eight white ministers from Birmingham entitled A Call for Unity was printed in the Birmingham News. The letter called for an end to protests and demonstrations for civil rights in Birmingham. King spent eight days in jail in Birmingham. On April 16, 1963, King responded to a call of unity with his own call, which has come to be known as, as his letter from Birmingham jail. This letter was thought to be originally published in the Christian Century and was reprinted soon after in Atlantic Monthly Magazine under the title, The Negro is Your Brother. Dear Fellow Clergymen, while confined here in the Birmingham City Jail, I came across your recent statement calling our protest unwise and untimely. I feel that you are men of genuine goodwill and your criticisms are sincere. So, I would like to answer the statement in what I hope will be patient and reasonable way. You hate the protests that are taking place in Birmingham. Why do you not hate the reasons and conditions that brought the protest here? I am sure that each of you would want to find the real causes for the protest. I would agree it is unfortunate that these protests are taking place in Birmingham, but I would say it is more unfortunate that the white people in control of this city have ignored the black Americans living here. In any nonviolent action, there are four basic steps. Collect facts to find injustices, meet, talks, and negotiate, learn to control anger, and begin a direct action. We have gone through all of these steps of Birmingham. Birmingham is probably the most segregated city in the United States. Its ugly record of police brutality is known in every section of this country. Its unjust treatment of black Americans and the courts is shameful. These have been more unsolved bombings of black homes and churches in Birmingham than any other city in this nation. Black leaders tried to talk with city leaders. They refused. Last September, there were some talks with some of the leaders of the business in Birmingham. Certain promises were made by the store owners. There was the promise that stores would remove racial signs that bullied black people. Reverend Shuttlesworth and the leaders of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights agreed to stop any more protests because of this promise. As the weeks and months passed, we realized that we were the victims of a broken promise. The signs stayed in place. We prepared for direct action. We were aware of the difficulties involved, so we decided to start having workshops on nonviolence to control anger. We asked ourselves the questions, can you be hit and not hit back? And are you able to take the painful test of being in jail? You may well ask, why direct action? Why sit-ins at lunch counters, marches, and so forth? Isn't talking a better path? You are exactly right. Nonviolent direct action seeks to create tension so a community will begin to talk and negotiate. I am not afraid of the word tension. There is a type of helpful nonviolent tension that is necessary for growth. Socrates felt that it was necessary to create a tension in the mind to question half-truths. Nonviolent protest creates tension in society that will help men move from prejudice and racism towards understanding and brotherhood. Too long has our beloved Southland been bogged down by silence. We need a dialogue where both sides begin to talk and negotiate. My friends, history is the long and tragic story of the fact that groups with privileges or benefits do not give up those privileges on their own. One person may see the right thing to do, but as Professor Reinhold Neuber has reminded us, groups are more sinful and selfish than the single person. I guess it's easy for those who have never felt the stinging and darts of segregation to say, wait. You have not seen vicious mobs hang your mothers and fathers or drown your sisters and brothers or not seen the hate-filled policemen curse, kick, and even kill your black brothers and sisters and not be punished. You do not have to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she cannot go to the amusement park that has just been advertised on television. You have not seen tears in her little eyes when she is told that Fun Town is closed to colored children. You have not seen her mind begin to change. You have not seen her begin to change the way she thinks about white people. You don't have to answer your daughter's question. Daddy, why do white people treat colored people so mean? When you take a cross-country drive, you don't have to sleep in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no motel will let you in. 
every day, you don't have to see these awful white and colored signs. When your middle name becomes boy, even if you are a man, you will understand. When your wife and mother are never given the respected title Mrs., you will understand. We are forever fighting a sense of nobodiness. This is why we can no longer wait. You're upset because we break laws. I understand your feelings. But today, in 1963, your separate segregated schools do not obey the 1954 su Supreme Court's decision. One may well ask, how can you break some laws and obey others? The answer is that there are just laws and there are unjust laws. Now, what is the difference between the two? A just law is man-made. It is right and follows the law of God. Any law that uplift, uplifts is just. Any law that puts people down is unjust. All segregation laws are unjust because they separate and put down a person. Paul Tillich has said that separation is sin. I urge people to disobey segregation laws because they are wrong. But I urge them to obey the 1954 decision of the Supreme Court because it is right and it uplifts. There are some situations when a law is just, but it is used in an unjust way. For instance, I was arrested Friday on a charge of parading without a permit. Now, there is nothing wrong with this law, but when our protests cannot get a parade permit, the law becomes unjust. It goes against our First Amendment right to peaceful protest. Hitler's evil laws in Germany were legal. It was a crime to help a Jew, but I know I would have helped my Jewish brothers. In Hungary, freedom fighters broke the laws of communism, so today I would disobey anti-religious laws in a communist country. Yours for the cause of peace and brotherhood. M.L. King, Jr.